Hello and welcome to Scale Your Sales podcast. Now, my next guest is all about transformation, taking something that exists for a company and making it more beautiful. She specializes in creating synergies between people, processes and technology. So she's got a lot to offer us with her background in transformation, sales transformation, CRM, all of that. So welcome to Scale Your Sales podcast, Nikki Finnegan. Thanks for having me here today, Janice. I'm really excited to see you again. It's been a while since I last saw you. Yeah, well, we met at AAISP, which is the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals. Now, Nikki, you ran, led the Women's Connect chapter and invited me um, to come along to that. And actually, I've interviewed Suchi Patak, who was uh, on the panel when we um, attended the um, event at Cvent. So yeah, it's been lovely because I actually met quite a few people and some of which are, are um, on, the, on the podcast. It's always lovely to go to these events and see more, more women in sales. Um, but first, let, let me ask you about the, you know, our current experience. You know, we're all in lockdown, although we're kind of slowly releasing. You know, given that we're in challenging circumstances and have been for the last three months, what would your advice be to sellers to ride out the pandemic and come out strong? So I think my key piece of advice at the moment for sellers, more than anything, be empathetic. You know, really don't go in with the hard sell. Build your pipeline through actually building the relationships as old school as that may or may not sound. I actually think it's really important um, because when people come out the other side, the world is going to be different. People may not be in the same position anymore. They may have gone someone else, but what they will remember is that you were kind to them. You were empathetic to them. And actually you probably had a better chat with them because one, they probably wanted to talk to someone else that wasn't their family because they've been sick of seeing the same four walls and the same people. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, people do remember that people remember the humanness. And right now we all need to be, a lot more human than you know we sometimes are and i get we've got quotas we've got you know kpis we've got deadlines and timelines and all these sorts of things but actually it becomes really important to take a moment take a beat because you don't know what that person who picks up the phone who reads an email who reads a linkedin message is going through they could have lost a family member to COVID. they could have been made redundant or furloughed or any number of things so be human, be empathetic, and build your pipeline through building relationships. It's interesting because, you know, I've heard a lot about being em empathetic, uh, you know, and it's like, we should be doing this anyway. Or, you know, it shouldn't take a, a pandemic because sales is about relationships, about people. Um, and so the kind of core to that is really understanding other people's perspective, which is what empathetic is, is, is being. I wonder, I don't know your view, if we get, you feel that in sales, we're going to come out of this different, there's going to be a different focus going forward. Um, so that empathy that should have existed before actually is the thing that kind of leads the way going forward, even without a pandemic. I don't know what your view is. My worry, if I'm honest with you at the moment, is that coming out the other side of the pandemic, the quotas will be tougher the um, KPIs will be harder. And that's where we're losing the empathy, the relationship building. You know, I can my husband, and I know I'm biased because he's my husband. He is also the most charming man in the universe. He's extremely good at what he does. And he has, you know, met clients or met, you know, people like you and I've met at AISP and things like that. He's met them at different events or reached out to them on LinkedIn and started a conversation. And they may not have been ready right then and he can identify that but he still talks to them because why wouldn't you and then 12 18 months later what's happened is they've come back and said actually you know we've been talking about this i've been seeing your post i've been doing this they come back but it's he hasn't done a hard sell and he hasn't worried about things like kpis he's looked at objectives and the objectives should be customer experience customer journey building relationships 
because wherever you go, they'll still always talk to you. You know, thinking about B2B sellers and, and the way that they're shifted. Do you think that what is the one thing that you think we should take forward to make sure we remain in the B2B world customer centric? You know, focusing on the customer. What's the one thing that people need to take forward? I think um, the thing that they need to take forward it, or that should have been there already, and, and it's like you said earlier about the empathy, it should already be there. Um, I really think it, it has to be about the customer, you know, taking, taking forward, how are they going to buy? How do they, how did they buy before this? How do they buy now? And how are they going to buy tomorrow? And how do you um, be agile enough to adapt yourself, to reflect on yourself and say, right, these customers are mine they're doing it differently therefore i should do it differently as opposed to i've done this for 25 years i'm going to keep doing it the same way because you know we see that all the time right all the time it, it is about being different being unique personalizing it but personalizing it to your customer's buying journey and that looks different and it's looked different in the last five years we could monitor it over the last five years and we know it's changed and changed and changed through technology, social media platforms, you know, more information being available to us as buyers, even as personal consumers. It, you know, we do so much research, right? You know, I've, I don't know about you, but how many times have you ha picked up the phone or um, looked at an email or a LinkedIn message and they haven't even looked at your profile. They would not know who you are to save their life. Yeah. I think that research understanding, you know, it plays back to the empathy part, plays back to your customer journey. Uh, yeah, that, I laughed at two, two things uh, that you said. One, you know, about the traditional salesperson who I absolutely love um, working with. I remember going into a company and this, you know, as talk, you know, I talk about social selling um, transformation and, uh, you know, they've always kind of had the uh, relationships where not even email, um, not that I'm uh, uh, saying that that's a good thing, but, you know, it's always been face to face. It's always been um, it, uh, building the relationship in the traditional means. So when I was introducing social media to them, talking about that, it's like, well, our customers aren't on social media, so why should we be? And it's like, well, if you're not on social media, how do you know your customers aren't? <laughs> you know? And also, yep. many of the customers were, you know, they've been their customers, you know, this was, although it was B2B, it's often um, uh, uh, owner led. And uh, they are getting older. They're probably looking to retire, as this, this, this company told me. Well, who's going to take over? It's going to be the digital natives that are going to take over if that relationship is going to continue and will they want to work with someone that you know can barely use a smartphone <laughs> yeah and that that digital natives that you refer to that is a big change i think that we're going to see as a result of the pandemic right we've all gotten used to working from home or um doing things some some bizarre things let's be honest on on <laughs> video calls these days but um i think it more than ever and it was already going that way that whole digital seller thing becomes important that will be one of the big changes that comes out of this gone are the days where you go and lunch and wine and dine people you know you can build strong relationships online via video you don't need to be face to face anymore plenty of deals plenty of multi-million pound or euro dollar deals are done like this and it's interesting, uh, what I still hear people say, well, it's not the same. Of course, it's not the same. But actually, because of needs must, people are forgetting the channel that we're using and actually relaxing and getting comfortable with it. So we forget that we're on video and you do the same things, but you adapt in the way that you do it. But you actually you're not conscious of actually doing that. So you're absolutely right in that, you know, the way that we communicate, the channels that we're using are changing, but because we're getting comfortable with it, there's no reason why big deals can't be done through this medium. There's absolutely no, we, we now, because we're having to do it, we can conceive it's possible. And I don't think that we're going to go back to where we, we are. So those people that have been resisting these transformation, digital transformation, 
I've really kind of got no choice because they're going to become derelict, <laughs> you know, defunct. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, we even, so we're doing house renovations. We even have had um, whole quotes and surveys done just through pictures and everything's spot on. Yeah. So if you can do that so that we can get a kitchen extension, I'm pretty sure we can sell whatever you need over video, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, before we came on live, I was talking about Virtualize. I, I keynoted um, for an event and I was keynoting in the e-commerce um, stream. So I had to do loads of research because although it's sales, you know, I wanted to make sure that it was relevant to the audience. So I've got this whole new keynote that I'm desperate to kind of run with, with other people. But, you know, retail and B2B um, e-commerce is becoming more and more and more important. And uh, it's interesting that companies that really didn't just kind of paid it lip service are really now investigating in and how they can transform their operations and processes to make more of it online so that, you know, the buyer who most buyers, a lot of buyers do not want to deal with salespeople until they absolutely have to. And then salespeople waste their time by telling them things they already know, which is, you know, another thing, but actually e-commerce is going to be taking up a lot, lot of the, the slack. So we're seeing a lot of, of transformation. Now I know that you talk a lot and, and help companies with transformation. So perhaps, you know, give us more information of the type of transformation in the kind of B2B environment that you do that kind of helps the sales process. Um, so a lot of the stuff I do, the catalyst is often technology, right? So they make a decision. We want to go to a particular platform. But we all know that you can't go to that platform if everyone's not going to use it. So the key is, it, it's again about people, right? And the people thing is so important. Take the people on a journey with you. And it's a bit the same with selling, right? You've got to take the buyer on the right journey, but you, you now have to go on their journey. So the key thing that I help companies with in this transformation space is, Let's understand what your customer journey looks like. How does that fit into then the processes? How do we fit that to a solution? How do we get the people to do this the whole way along? So it's not some random nasal whining Australian woman <laughs> telling you what your new customer journey or process is going to look like. You know, it's you with her facilitating, helping you get there and asking you really bizarre questions. You know, that's how the transformation has to happen. You have to take it one step at a time, or as we like to say, we eat the elephant one bite at a time. And it's taking the people on the journey first, let them be part of it, let them drive it, let them own it, because they are the best resources any company has. They know your customers so well, you know, they know the ins and outs of the organization so well. So when they are engaged in that journey, the change becomes a lot easier, but you've got to get them over that hump first. And the key is always, you know, let them be the driver. It's interesting because I'm sure you've seen this, the mistakes that um, a lot of companies make. You have, you know, the executives making the decision on, on the transformation, which is great, and that's what they need to do, but they forget about the customer facing. The people at the, the coal face are absolutely instrumental in the process. And so these things often land on them. And it's like, oh no, you know, this is, they know it's gonna work, not gonna work instantly. And if they were only part, as you say, part of that journey to make sure that, you know, it landed really well and it was relevant to the customer, because as you say, they know what works works best. And a lot of transformations fail, Janice, because people don't adopt the tools because they haven't been the ones to input into it. Yes, obviously you create guidelines, but make them part of that piece as well. So make them part of the whole piece. But the structure of how you manage your transformation is actually key critical to it. Do you have the right stakeholders? Do you have the right subject matter experts? All, you know, there's a bunch of different things that go with this and how you manage that and how you're agile with that and how you reflect and be retrospective on it, which we should all do as people, you know, we should always be doing internal retrospectives on ourselves and that helps the process. So the way I do it and the way I work with my clients is 
you know, we go on this big journey together and we constantly reflect on ourselves and where we have to, we change course and we redirect, which it's the same as the sales journey, right? Yeah. You reflect on how your meeting went with your client or potential client, and then you course adjust if it didn't go so well, or, you know, you look at what they wanted and keep it moving in the right direction. And this also reminds me when I go into companies and, you know, the CRM system, uh, you know, often Salesforce and how people are not actually utilizing it. You know, I mean, it's, it's a massive resource, but they're actually not utilizing it at all to help them and enable them. And so, you know, uh, it costs, you know, th these applications do cost a lot of money, but they really can enable you. Most people <laughs> are not are not working um, with them. So because they haven't had someone sit with them, and it's not what I do, but I can see that it's a major problem, you know, um, sit with them, hold their hands and work through the process. And it's not only important for the salesperson at the front end, but it's also important for the organization at the back end. So they're retaining the information. And it's, and it's critical for the custom to, customer to make sure that it's consistent what they're, they're, they're receiving. So I, I, yeah, I, I come across CRM systems an awful lot uh, where that has been a real kind of problem. And it's really interesting because you know that it's such a worthwhile tool. You know that it's full of data, but you know, back to our, uh, the earlier part of our conversation, people are driven by KPIs and they often feel that a CRM and the tools that surround a CRM are really for everyone else but them. They're just a slave to management's KPIs, right? Which that sounds quite harsh, but that's a lot of the sentiment behind it. As opposed to understanding what are the real benefits you get from utilizing it? And, and you know, then you plug it into things like LinkedIn and all that sort of stuff, and it becomes a huge enabler. And I think that becomes critical, having all the right tools with the right process, because let's not forget sales is art and science joined together. At, and that's what makes it beautiful. Get all of the pieces of the puzzle and it can be a beautiful thing. Um, and I think that's the key. Let's join the art and the science together. And, you know, we live in a process oriented world. Sales is a process because your, your buyers are going through their buying journey and process. So by proxy, you're in there with them. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you've talked a lot about people and not forgetting people. So I want to talk about where we met. Um, diversity and your view on the diversity in B2B selling industry. And, you know, if you feel it's progressed and what you feel, if it hasn't progressed, what, what needs to be done? The stats are a little bit terrifying. Um, and I don't think diversity, you know, is as prominent as we would like it to be in the sales space. I think it, it could be substantially better, but I also think actually, interestingly, as a result of COVID, naturally, um, people relate to people. You want to see, you know, something of yourself when you're talking to someone, whether it's leadership level or, you know, um, whether it's the sales journey, buying journey, you want to see someone that is relatable to you, right? Characteristics, personality traits, every aspect of, of that spectrum. And I think there's a lot more to be done in the sales space to actually achieve that. With COVID-19, I think, and I talk about women a lot, we by nature are more nurturing and we have a different outlook in a different way about us than men do um which is which is quite a controversial statement and if my husband is listening to this he's going to get angry about that <laughs> but um i think we we can really shine in this space because we are more empathetic we are more looking at how someone feels versus trying to get the deal and hit the kpis and you know my mum was in sales and i think i was telling you this she was so successful because she wasn't KPI driven and yet she exceeded quota every year for 30 years in a male dominated industry, which is steel, you know, so right. And, and all by the phone, by the way, she didn't go out and see clients all on the phone. Wow. Yeah. So 
I think we have a real opportunity with the COVID pandemic to actually make our sales teams more diverse, to actually, and, and the medium and the forums that we use now actually take away a lot of different things for us as well. So I think, you know, sometimes hearing a softer voice or a different voice is actually a good thing. Mm-hmm. What's your view on, on quotas? Well, that's a controversial question. <laughs> no, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> um, it's, it's an interesting thing. So I am a qualified accountant. So my accountant brain says, of course, they're an, they're an important part to the process. And look, every company needs to hit budgets to, you know, and balance everything out and make sure there's a profit and all these sorts of things. But then the quota thing and the KPI thing, so all the metrics, all the numbers have a tendency, depending on your personality, um, to take away some of the human aspect. And that's where I think it's risky. So I think, yes, you do need quotas, but I think you need a combination of objectives that are around the customer that, and even actually that are around the individual seller, right? You know, how are you, how are you tracking and this back to this is back to the internal retrospective that you do on yourself. How are you tracking against your personal objectives, right? For you, and actually that you have agreed with your line manager, your team, your company, whatever it may be. I think that's quite an important thing. So you need a balance of quota and objectives. KPIs, as I say, I think become a risky business. Yeah, it's interesting. I was having a conversation the other day about. Um, uh, the incentives, you know, whether it's commission um, and people will, um, their behaviours track the way they're measured. <laughs> so if the underlying measurement is on numbers, then they tend to treat people. We want people to have human relationships, but they tend to treat people or they're driven by the numbers. So yeah. it's really, I mean, it's a whole podcast on 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 its own but the reason why I asked you that was because you talk a lot about the relationships and whether it's you know kind of diverse relationships and how that is uh, um, important or in COVID-19 all of that but I think in sales there's always a balance isn't there between on the one hand that being customer centric and, and driving for you know being customer focused and and relationships and on the other hand you know the economics of of the business it's really difficult and how you measure that and how you um incentivize people and they're going to be driven by the the numbers if you're incentivizing people by by numbers so it, it is a difficult conversation i also think interestingly um how a company is structured for aftercare of customers as well plays a big factor because sales can do a great job hand off to aftercare and aftercare perhaps don't don't build on those relationships you know that's risky this is why i say sometimes the objectives aspect alongside your quotas or targets becomes quite important and some of those objectives are around retention and i don't mean just churning and burning i mean actual uh, relevance and alignment to a customer journey what is the right thing for the customers what are the right touch points how does that work i know i was reading um one of your blog posts and you know someone was talking about um you know checking in with customers at various points in a year cycle right and I think they agreed with their customer what works best for them. I think that becomes really important, but that's an objective. It's also the relationship building aspect and also you're retaining the revenue and potentially selling more because you've built the strong relationship. So it's the correlation and the linkage of everything. Excellent, excellent. Now, um, let's return to your mother because I know she is your shero. So tell me more because obviously she's, you know, a strong woman at the time in steel that she was was selling. So tell me more about, you know, your shero. Um, sadly, I did not appreciate her enough until I got a bit older. Um, but I guess that's like all of us, right? Um, and, but my mum has been that that force in my life that was the one who always said it doesn't matter what you want to do 
if you set your mind to it, you can achieve it. Um, and she did it. I mean, she was, you know, one of the only women in sales in steel in Australia, which is where I grew up. Um, and you know, for her to be the one that customers went to without her needing to do anything other than be kind, be empathetic and to build that relationship with them, you know, customers moved companies when she moved companies because they didn't want to deal with other people. So she's, she was a strong woman who held a full-time job, raised two children. Um, my dad had a construction business. So she also took care of all of his accounts and accounting, um, you know, paying his, his teams and all that sort of stuff and balanced absolutely everything. So, you know, she is my hero for all those reasons. And she's just so tough. She'll tell you as it is, um, she's not afraid to speak her mind. And she taught me that as well, mm -hmm. you know, stand up for yourself. Don't be afraid to speak your mind. Um, you know, be forthcoming. That's the only way you're going to be able to move forward. Excellent. What a great woman. Great woman. So Nikki, how can listeners get hold of you? You can find me on LinkedIn. And I know I should be more active. This COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic has seemed like my work has increased. How did that happen? <laughs> um, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but yes, you can, you can find me on LinkedIn um, or you can go to the protellosgroup.com page and contact me there. Excellent. Oh, I'll put that in, in the show notes. And, you know, you've been an absolute star. Thank you so much for being a guest on Scale Your Sales podcast, Nikki Finucan. Thanks for having me. Take care of yourself and stay safe. You stay safe too. Thank you. Thank you.